Welcome to another snowy, very small camper van video. We're at a friend's place in the country for the weekend, and as you can see, it's pretty snowy here, so it's a perfect time to make some upgrades on the inside of the van. One of the things I didn't have time to do before camping season last year was this center console. I made a quick one, but now that I have some time, I'm going to make a nice one, and I'm going to upgrade some of my electrical system while I'm at it. First step is to take the old console out. So let's take a look at the new components I got for the electrical system. This fancy socket will give me a spot to plug in my Genius battery charger. I use it as a kind of substitute shore power. Last year we spent a lot of time trying to guess the state of charge of the battery. We bought a simple voltage monitor and got pretty good at estimating levels based on that, but we hadn't have anything concrete to go on. So in an effort to know what is actually going on, I decided to switch to a charge controller with a Bluetooth module so we could use an app on our phones to see what was actually happening. This one, like the old one, has a port for a temperature sensor, as well as the solar and battery hookups, but it also has this RS-232 port for the Bluetooth. But after we bought it, we realized that while it will tell us how much power the solar is producing and the state of charge of the battery, it would not be able to tell us how many amps the loads were pulling, since the 30 amp wanderer does not have load terminals. And that is the part we really wanted to know. So in the end, I decided to also install a battery monitor with a shunt. The one I got is from a company called Aili, which is available on Amazon and costs about $60 Canadian. It comes with written instructions, which you should not lose because they don't seem to be available anywhere else on the internet. And you also get the shunt, the monitor itself, and a small shielded cable to connect the two. A shunt is basically a big, precise, known resistor and by putting it in a circuit between the battery and all the rest of the electrical system, it allows the battery monitor to calculate the voltage and amperage by measuring the voltage drop across the resistor. I'm also adding a double USB socket, which will be used for charging phones or running small fans. These sockets all seem to come with annoying little LED lights, but at least this one have the cover. I'm using one of the 12 volt sockets I took out of the back. They were bought off Amazon pretty cheaply, and while they seem to work fine, they have a flaw that the positive connector pushes loose when you try to push a spade connector onto it. So you have to be careful while connecting it, but once it's connected, then it's fine. Before starting any of the work on the wiring, I'm going to disconnect the starter battery from the battery isolator at this 150 amp breaker. Next, I'm going to remove the front panels of the battery enclosure so I can access the charge controller and the wiring. Taking the fuses out disconnects the solar panels from the charge controller and also from the battery. Always disconnect the solar panels first. You never want to have the solar panels connected to the charge controller without a battery for the power to go to. If not, you can burn out the charge controller. After removing even more of the wood panels, I've managed to remove the old charge controller and I've wired up the new one in its place. And now I'm going to move on to the shunt. I've disconnected all the negative wires from the battery, and since I had a lot of slack in the original ground wire, I'm just going to cut off a piece of that to use to connect the shunt to the battery. I'm going to be using a ball bearing and a vise to attach the new copper lugs. I'm going to use a bit of masking tape to hold the bearing in place where I want it. And I've stripped the cable, making sure I left just enough wire to fill the lug. Then I'm going to use the vise to squeeze the bearing into the soft copper lug to crimp it. Okay, so once I get the tape off, you can see the nice indent, just like a crimper would have done. I did the same thing to the other cable end. And now just to finish up with some electrical tape. These are the two poles of the shunt. 
the P negative side and the B negative side that goes to the battery. Since I only have four connections to make, I can fit them all onto the bolt. If I had more, I would need to add a bus bar to spread them out. The bolts are held in the back of the shunt by shaped holes in the acrylic, so I don't want to tighten any of my connections too much. Now on the battery side. After all that, I made the cable a bit too long, but I don't have any more lugs, so it's going to have to do as is. I've run a wire from my fuse box to power the shunt and monitor. This goes into either one of these B positive terminals on the side and I need a teeny tiny Phillips screwdriver to screw it in. So far I have the shunt just sitting on the wood, mostly because I didn't realize I would not be able to get at the screw holes once I'd added all the wires. But it's held in place by all the wires connected to it, so I don't think it's going to move around much. So I'm going to leave it like that for now. Here's my new console. Much better than the first plain plywood box. I decided to spray paint it with a black paint with a hammered finish, which kind of echoes the texture of the dash, and blends in with the color of the front of the van. I just need to connect up my trick 12 volt socket, making sure the pin doesn't get pushed in. It's all easier to do because I haven't wired it up yet. The socket just fits snugly into its one inch hole and its ring holds it in place. Now for the battery monitor. It fits into a 2 and 1 8 of an inch diameter hole, and this cable will connect it to the shunt. I've made a slot between the inside of the console and the front for the wire. This little bracket is what holds the monitor in place. It fits into this th plastic threaded bolt sticking out of the back and gets snug down with a plastic wind nut. It's not the most elegant solution, but it works. Back around the front, I'm adding cable clips to keep all my wires in place, even if the console gets moved around. I don't want any of my connectors to come loose. But I do want the option of disconnecting everything and removing the console if I need to. All the wires fit into this front section and then pass out of a notch under the left side of the console. Before closing up the panel, I've labeled each end of each wire and checked that the Bluetooth is working. I've passed all the wires through the hinged edge of the floor panel. Most of them can fit through the gaps, but others like the 12 volt plug on the Genius have to be slipped in around the edge. I've got a few last connections to make. The monitor to the shunt. This is a temperature probe. Its cable is way longer than I need since my battery is right beside the charge controller, but I can just coil up the rest and put it down beside the battery. And the Genius has its own proprietary connectors. Next, I'm going to label all the wires. So let's go over the electrical system as a whole, part by part. We're going to start with the shunt that I just installed. It interrupts all the negative wires leading to the battery, allowing the monitor to measure the voltage and current. We have wires going to the charge controller, the negative pole of the fuse box, the Genius battery charger, and this big one is the ground wire that is attached to the chassis bolted under the front driver's seat. The shunt connects to the monitor via this shielded cable and is powered from the fuse box with this wire. The instructions that came with it said to connect it directly to the positive on the battery, but in my case that would have been a lot more trouble. Plus I only have a few things connected to the fuse box, so I had room to give it its own circuit. On the positive side, I have the cable coming from the charge controller, the battery isolator, the fuse box, and the Genius charger. Again, since there are only four, I have them all connected directly to the battery terminal. I have a 10 amp fuse between the solar panels and the charge controller. It's sized based on the highest amperage of the panels, plus 25% safety factor. A 3 amp inline fuse on the wire between the charge controller and the battery, and it's sized to match the amp rating of the charge controller. And I have a 10 amp fuse that comes with the Genius. The battery isolator has a 150 amp breaker in the engine compartment close to the main battery. 
started out with 100 watt solar panel that stored in the van and could easily be plugged in via the SAE plug, but I've since decided to mount that panel on the roof. Now I have a second 50 watt panel in the van and I can hook them both up if I need a little extra power. The wire from the solar on the roof and from the SAE plug join here before going to the charge controller. The wires I used are 4 gauge for the battery isolator and main ground, 10 gauge for all the connections between the solar and the charge controller and battery, and 12 gauge for the cable that runs to the portable solar panel. Most of the other wiring in the van is also 12 or 14 gauge. The fuse box, which is hard to see where it is tucked away on the side, has room for 6 fuses. Two are for the 12 volt plugs in the console, they each have a 15 amp fuse. Next I have a 5 amp fuse for the USB sockets, another 5 amp for the power to the shunt and a last 5 amp fuse protects the wires going to the lights and USB sockets in the back. Here we have the temperature probe, but as I said, I'm not sure if it's compatible, so I might be switching it out for a different one. The battery compartment doesn't look the prettiest, but it does what it's supposed to do. I just need to pop the cover back on the fuse box and put the plexiglass guard back on. This protects the battery terminals from contact with any metal in the floor panels. One of the flaws with my inexpensive battery monitor is that it flashes its backlight when charging, which is not what you want when you're trying to sleep. That's why I built the console with a cover for the electrical system, but I also cut a hole to mount a bullseye level into the top, and light leaks through around it. So I'm going to mask it off with some aluminum tape and some black gaffer's tape. Now I need to set the parameters for the battery monitor. To set the battery size on the monitor, you have to press and hold the amp hour button for three seconds. Then you can use the left and right arrow buttons to set the amp hours. The default is 100 amp hours and I'm going to need to go all the way down to 90 amp hours for my battery. And then press the amp hours again to set it. To set the percentage of capacity, first make sure the battery is full and then press and hold the percentage button for three seconds. Its default is 0% but if you press the button again, it will switch to 100%. So the monitor will show amps being added or removed. Amp power is available. Voltage or percentage of capacity. Right now it's hard to test it out as I don't have any real loads on the battery. But if I compare my three displays, plug-in voltmeter, battery monitor, and the Bluetooth app, I get about the same reading but my temperature readings are way off. The plug-in meter gives a realistic reading of 12 degrees Celsius, but the app says minus 29 degrees Celsius, which it's definitely not. I'm gonna do an update of how the monitor and Bluetooth app work after I've had a chance to use it while camping, as well as a more in-depth look at my solar setup in the spring when it's easier to film. I hope you found this video useful. If you have any questions, please ask below in the comments and I'll get back to you. Or if you have any comments or tips for me, please put them in the comment section too. I'll be making more videos soon, so please subscribe and click the bell icon to get notifications when the new video comes out. As always, thanks for watching.